Hello, everyone, and welcome to Body Memory, a conversation on flesh and stone. Before I begin, I would like to call everyone to locate themselves specifically and geographically within their bodies. Notice the weight of your feet on the ground, your spine resting on hip bones, your hip bones resting on flesh, your flesh resting on the cushion of your chair. Maybe shift in your seat a little bit, rocking gently back and forth, feeling the sturdiness of your weight in the chair, its legs resting evenly on the floor, the floor made possible by the building's foundation, the foundation established and nestled in the earth, the porous, uneven, living, drinking, breathing, cool, drowsy earth. Take a deep breath in, closing your eyes if you'd like, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. And as you breathe in, create a sense of taking in fresh air. And as you breathe out, a sense of letting go, releasing the stress of your body for a moment, your mind, and feeling your muscles soften. Let us each think in this moment together whose traditional homelands we're living within whose resources we've inherited and used for daily nourishment, whose sacred spaces we breathe and work and communicate and love upon together within, who was here thousands of years before us, and how do we bring action to the call to reconcile our nation's violent pasts against our indigenous peoples? How do we give back? How do we refuse the harmful practice of euphemizing history, which we do so often, sometimes to make ourselves feel okay, or just to make things more easy, for the sake of creating one smooth narrative that we can all agree upon, that places legacies of colonization in the very distant past and renames genocides, like things like conflict? How do we get in the habit of naming abuses of powers as we see them? My name is Sarah Fritchie. I am zooming in from the sacred homelands of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shakatoke, Golden Hill, Pocasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac people and other Algonquin speaking peoples in a place that we now call the state of Connecticut. The word of Connecticut in and of itself is derived from various anglicized settings of Quanetiqua a Mohegan Pequot word for long tidal river. I'm the guest curator of the current exhibition at Real Artways called Statues Also Die, which explores some of the questions we just moved through together. Our settler colonial inheritances, the ever-present threat of whitewashing national historical narratives, the inherent drive to euphemize state-sanctioned violence for peace of mind and profit, and all of these misgivings, bold opposites, which I know a lot of us on this call probably aspire to. Our ability to self-author, to self-publish, to self-define, to spark paradigm shifts and determine our own versions of what it means to belong. If you haven't seen statues also die yet, today is its final day. Um, so you have a few more hours left to pay to visit. Uh, the galleries are open until 6 p.m. Um, I'm going to add to the Q&A box right now a link to the video walkthrough and a copy of the exhibition text, um, just in case you can't make it there. technical difficulties. <laughs> I will have my backup behind the scenes, Megan Bent send that link. Um, in a nutshell, the exhibition brings together the practices of 12 artists into collectives who challenge and renovate the traditional concepts of monument and memorial, and who pose alternatives for how these notions might play out in public space in ways that prioritize the human body over a sculpted body. 
set amid the backdrop of a year that was eye-opening and spiritually work-weary, the exhibition asks a central question. What new purposes, status, faith, and power is endowed into an object when you give it the name monument? The artist's combined efforts and statues also die, shed a light on a new set of possibilities for our, our memorial landscape that is iconoclastic and revolutionary, intimate, full of humor, mobile, and not meant to live forever. I'm joined today by two of the artists in the show, Marisa Williamson and Jeffrey Maris, and writer, scholar, curator, and educator T.K. Smith, who was the one to coin the title for this talk, Body Memory. Before I introduce today's speakers and turn it over to TK to moderate, I would just like to formally thank Real Artways for hosting this show and putting in all the extra love and care and work that made it safe for visitors to view it during the pandemic. Will, Neil, Megan, David, you are a well-greased engine. To the artists who contributed to this exhibition but are not present on this call, thank you all, especially as you grow older for giving us hope um, that we can maintain creative practices to the Andy Warhol Foundation of the Visual Arts and the Friends of Real Artways for generously supporting the show, to the organizations who cleared the hurdles of COVID to help us secure and prepare loans, including Friedman Gallery, Ronald Feldman Gallery, now and there, and Promps Press, and to our wordsmith co-presenter, The Art Papers, for producing a dense, raw, poetic, critical, open-ended journal um, that we'll talk a little bit more about in a second that, like the show, is dedicated to rethinking monuments. So today's speakers, today's speakers will include Marisa Williamson, a project-based artist who works in video image making installation performance around the themes of history, race, feminism, and technology. Marisa has produced site-specific works at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, Storm King, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the University of Virginia, Spaces Cleveland, Monument Lab in Philly, and for this exhibition, debuts a piece set in the National Park Service. Williamson's contribution to Statues Also Die is titled Monuments to Escape, and in it she imagines 12 monuments set along New England's National Scenic Trail that center the experiences of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people in New England. This trail is a lesser known 215 mile footpath that stretches from the mouth of the Connecticut River to the Massachusetts Vermont's border. And the piece is composed of a trail map, a video, and a podcast to give you a taste of um, the range of monuments that her piece includes. She presents a memorial to Gladys, Tante Gijin, a medicine woman, an indigenous protector of ancient seeds, Augustus Washington, a black portrait photographer who opened a studio in his Hartford residence in 1846, and a memorial to America's obsession with gun violence, perpetuated regionally by cultural conceit and our local revolver manufacturing companies. Her podcast is available for this piece for download for free on SoundCloud. And I will also ask Megan um, behind the scenes to share a link with you all through the Q&A box. Our other panelist and artist in the show, Jeffrey Maris, is a mixed media artist who was born in Haiti, raised in the Bahamas, and is currently based in New Haven, where he serves as a year-long fellow at Next Haven Studio. He earned an Associate of Arts degree in Arts and Crafts from the University of the Bahamas, a BFA in Sculpture from Tyler School of Art, and an MFA from Columbia University. His kinetic sculpture, Hot Off the Block, featured in the exhibition, is composed of a plaster cast of the artist's torso counterbalanced by a cinder block. Designed to self-destruct over the course of the show, the torso is triggered to rub against the side of a giant metal cheese-like grate whenever a viewer approaches it. The piece did what it promised during the run of Statues Also Die, breaking down four weeks into the show. Um, and you can see a picture of this work in my Zoom background. Finally, TK Smith is an Iowa-born, Philadelphia-based writer, art critic, curator, and educator. He's the curator of Virtual Remains, a group exhibition of Atlanta-based artists opening at the Atlanta Contemporary in 2021. Look out for that. And a PhD candidate in the History of American Civilization program at the University of Delaware where he researches art, material culture, and the built environment. 
Most recently, Smith co-edited Monumental Interventions, the fall winter 2020 issue of Art Papers that explores where the concerns of art intersect with those of monument and memorial. In the words of Hartford-born choreographer Arian Wilkerson, TK's practice is monuments. And we're thrilled that they've joined us today to serve as the moderator for this conversation. I'll now pass the mic over to TK um, so that TK, you can lead us um, in a conversation and tell us a little bit more about the making of, of interventions. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, I have to say uh, it's been an extreme pleasure to have co-edited the, the most recent issue of Art Papers. And it just so happened to be kismet, you know, Sarah Higgins, the editor of Art Papers, invited me on as a guest co-editor because Monuments, as Arian said, as you said, is kind of what I do. And together we were able to create something super, super beautiful and super poignant in this moment, but also in a discourse that at this time feels ridiculously fast. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's doing something with it. Artists are responding to people's anxieties right now, you know, and the issue kind of centers around this question of what are artists doing right now? What intervention, not just responding to empty plinths and pedestals, but how are they responding to a, a history and a legacy of monument and memorial making that has a legacy of exclusion and erasure? Um, so, you know, please, uh, it is available now on artpapers.org. It is $10. It's very affordable. It's a beautiful issue. It shines in the sunlight. I contributed a piece. Uh, Tusif Noor contributed a piece. Rial Christian contributed a piece. And there's some beautiful archival pieces that kind of dig into this long history of interventions that artists have been making. And some of the artists in the dossier um, are actually in uh, the exhibition that Sarah Fritchie curated. And so there's some beautiful crossovers between this issue and this exhibition that just made this kind of event seem so necessary. So thank you everybody involved for this happening. And I'm so thankful to be in conversation with Marisa and Jeffrey, whose work I just, I wish I could have seen it in person. Uh, unfortunately, you know, with what's going on, one day we will run into each other and we will share art and, and share ourselves. But for the moment now, what I think I, I want to start the conversation with, you know, now that I've said, please go buy art papers. Um, please check us out. There's content available online right now if you follow that link. But um, I want to start the conversation centering the body kind of like you did, Sarah. I want to talk about how you both, not just in the works that you've contributed to this exhibition, but in your practices, utilize the body, specifically your own body, to, to embody histories, memories, speculate futures? Where does the body kind of situate itself in your own practice? And how does that materialize into the works that folks have seen in the gallery? Um, and then at the end, I wanna tie it back in with Sarah because the title of the exhibition is Statues Also Die. You know, we're, we're giving the, the material human flesh and form. So uh, Marisa, if we could start with you, I'd, I'd love to know. Yeah. Um... Thank you, thank you for to everyone here for, for different things. Um, but yeah, when I think about the body, I had started, you know, years ago making work about um, Sally Hemings, Thomas Jefferson's, the, the enslaved mother of Thomas Jefferson's children. I continue to be really committed to figuring out, you know, what a monument might be for Sally Hemings. I think I was drawn to her because of the complete, you know, vacuum of, you know, evidence in contrast to the type of evidence and monument that exists for Thomas Jefferson. But I think a lot of my work comes out of a black feminist theory um, approach that's I think best articulated by the Combahee River Collective that talks about black women being, um, being you know, oppositional to white male impositions into their bodies and communities over the course of, of the of American history. And so I've been interested in how we um, kind of as Simone Brown puts it, like find ways of tracing um, black women's contributions even where they've been erased by looking at the contours left behind by their absence. And so my work is a lot about figuring out where those bodies begin and end, where the body isn't visible, but from the disruptions created around those bodies, 
tracing that to figure out um, where those people existed and what their contributions were and what their interior worlds might have been like. And for me, that's a kind of anti-monument because it's all about the absence. It's just completely about everything we can't see, everything we can't touch, everything we can't fully know, but have to kind of intuit using our own bodies and trying to trace a kind of continuity through shared like exteriors or appearances over time um, and, and figure out what black women, black history um, can offer the discourse around monuments, um, kind of in opposition to what we see, you know, punctuating the landscape today. So I think the body is just, it's just everything. I mean, I think it's, it's the only place to start. Uh, and thank you, Sarah, and thank you, TK, uh, for that lovely introduction and for having me here today. And thank you to everyone at Real Artways. I love that note that you ended on, Marissa, because I feel as though my body, or the reason why I come to the back to the body so often is because it's the first home that we inhabit, right? And to talk about the body is to speak of home. And a lot of my practice is, is on, on what that means. What does it mean to belong or what does it mean to not belong? And I think specifically to be a black immigrant man in the world in the way that I am in the world today, um, like my body just becomes a surrogate or some sort of a metaphor or lead into this broader, this broader dialogue. And more specifically with the work that I have in the show now, that comes, the block is hot comes from a body of work, Now You See Me, Now You Don't, that I've been sort of synthesizing for the last two and a half years, two and a half odd years. I got a ticket for jumping a turnstile in New York City um, one night, and I promised that I paid, but in, in the process of getting that ticket, um, a ticket it was everything surrounding it the mta police approached me and uh they asked me to follow them and i was listed as six foot seven and my weight was recorded as 250 pounds things ever in my life um and it became about what what sort of ghostly image is being produced of my body how does my body read in space? What are the things about my body that I can't control? And what, what kind of justification had this escalated? Would that give two police officers encountering a 250 pound, six foot seven black man on the atrium at 12 a.m. in the morning? Um, so that's really a space where this works come from. It's interrogating um, the body, it's interrogating my body. Um, it's also speaking towards the history of, of black writers that use white bodies as surrogates to talk about blackness. Um, and I'm just really grateful to be in this exhibition, especially around the theme of erasure because so much of the monuments that we live with or live around are specifically about that. I'm gonna hop back in real quick um, to just say like, Marisa, you specifically use your own body um, in a lot of your works, and particularly with this, this work, this multimedia, multi-interdisciplinary work that you've created for this exhibition, you don't only use your body as like a, a pathfinder, uh, a, a leader or a guide through these spaces to speculate monuments and memory. You are asking people to engage their own bodies and, and to take the trip for themselves. Um, I think that's really significant. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I had started making the work about Sally Hemings and then over, you know, after five years was being feeling really burdened with like having invited projection. One thing a body and a monument also do or allow people to project onto them. And I think it was through, um, through Monument Lab that I was able to, like, I got an invitation to break out of that work in a lot of ways. And I made a, a augmented reality smartphone scavenger hunt through Philadelphia that um, was the first for, for it, foray into this kind of collaborative inviting 
multiple people to propose scenes from history and to invite them to embody the way I had been embodying and to in so doing produce a chorus of voices, which was a lot more effective than, well, not a lot more effective, but I thought really useful and differently um, effective at kind of making these demands for justice, which I had been trying to do through embodying Sally Hemings through performance originally. And I think recently I've come to understand how powerful this chorus of historical ghosts can be like I think that's largely how people are feeling this call for justice around monuments is that those people who aren't on pedestals are like coming up out of the earth and like you know demanding whether it's in Charlottesville Richmond you know they're demanding to be heard because we've we've kind of flipped them onto an underside of the of the landscape and and they're they're not you know, detectable, readily detectable, unless you, you do this research. And so for um, monuments to escape on the New England scenic trail, that was even harder, I felt, to kind of conjure up because the landscape of New England, um, I think folks in New England generally feel very satisfied with their relationship to the past. I think in general, in New England, you know, people have been on the right side of uh, history and these kind of larger movements. But I think that made it all the more difficult, but all the more important to me as I did my research to find the places where um, things have been erased, where people have not done, um, you know, not done their their neighbors, historical neighbors justice, where um, we have appropriated the names of indigenous people, put them on street signs, school buildings, and then at the same time, and, and in so doing, assumed that they no longer exist, you know, that that the the Pequot or the 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 Mohegan are not no longer with us. Um, so I was really interested in how New England offered a, a really a more challenging um, landscape to produce that chorus of people, because I think it's a kind of quiet. Um, it's a kind of quiet place and it requires really close listening. Um, I mean, I think Sarah led us really well in a kind of close meditative listening to who, who, who has been pressed back into the, into the landscape and has to be kind of conjured out of it. So yeah, the chorus of voices is really important to me. And, and I think that's so beautiful when juxtaposed with Jeffrey, because for me, when we have this conversation about the body and visibility and the visibility of, of, of culture and history, which also becomes contestable when it's visible, right? It also becomes what is more black, putting pork in your greens or, or smoked turkey in your greens and, you know, all those kinds of conversations. But um, I love the juxtaposition because Jeffries is so close to their own personal physical body and likeness um, and, in, and, and it the work visibly shows the vulnerability of that body with just another presence in that space. And so in terms of like the discourse that's happening with monuments out on the street, it's like together we can pull this down, you know, and, and something in that togetherness feels like strength. But a lot of times when you're existing in your own body, what you're fighting for that justice, that, that equality, that, that contention between you and your environment is just your body. Um, Jeffrey, could you talk more about that, uh, that vulnerability and your willingness to be vulnerable in that way? You, the conversation that I began in the introduction. Work in making this work. So I got this ticket where, again, six foot seven, 250 pounds, and me, at the time, the way that I thought about the world was very like, how dare you give me this ticket? I'm gonna use every tool that I have to fight this thing. And I end up going to court. And here I am in court fighting this $100 ticket because I'm too cheap to pay it. And I feel as if I've been wronged and I need to undo this wrong. And I realized like, why are there only black and brown people in this courtroom fighting the same case that I'm fighting, right? And that's not to say that these, like some of us probably didn't actually jump and didn't pay. In my case, it was just that I had just moved to New York and I didn't know how to use my MTA card and it took my money and so I jumped. And so that was my whole spiel. Um, and I realized that 
and brown people fighting that case, uh, the, the same sort of circumstance. And I was in Columbia simultaneously. And this is not to say that the entire MFA program at Columbia is racist, but there was definitely this feeling of like, my specific needs aren't being met by the pedagogical cross structure of my graduate. I was one of four black students at the time, I believe, right? In a class of 54 split between two years. And so it became this moment of me reconciling with what all of these things mean, right? On the one hand, I'm hyper visible, right? In this judicial criminal system. But then on the other hand, I'm invisible when it comes to like education and higher, higher education and sort of like these otherworldly things. So the work really becomes about like this friction that exists between those two spaces. And I feel as though the most available way of making that friction seen and felt was by using my body in the way that it is being used, right? So that that destruction isn't necessarily just a physical one. For me, it's also about sort of to like these ideas, right? Wanting to make, and then one, one other thing was like, I also think about this as being a vessel of sorts, right? Like I think about how, how like, when something racist or fucked up happens to you, where does that trauma live? Does it become a part of their chemical DNA makeup? And is there a way that I can extract that information and somehow use that body, that cast somehow becomes a vessel and all this racialized trauma and violence lives in that? And would it be a stretch to say, okay, I'm literally like destroying this trauma, like I'm grinding it down Thank you, thank you. I think that did in that, this how to visualize um, just like how to visualize trauma and to visualize struggle. It came up in what I'm putting together for the last series, the last episode in the podcast. I spoke to two students who I'd worked with in the past. One's a current student, and one graduated from the University of Hartford. They're both Black women, and we kept coming back around to like questions of of what is magic, like what kind of magic power do you possess? This comes out of um, an interest in Tituba, the first one of the first people accused of being a witch in Salem Village. She was a, a black woman enslaved there. And then, then it got intersected with this question of like the law as it existed for Puritans, which forbid, you know, people from practicing anything outside of, you know, um, a very strict, uh, regimen of, of Christianity and she of course was practicing like healing and possibly you know you know West Indian practices but we were I was asking these two women Cherokee Cowherd and Hunter Parker two black students what they felt was their magic and we were really talking about what is this unseeable um, power to absorb you know absorb trauma this question of where does it go was really interesting to us and how does it find its way back out into the world and in what ways are art practices um you know ways of kind of transforming that trauma and trying to make it visible for people who otherwise um might have that work disappear i mean this is it was a Miranda, meandering conversation but we talked about the very long history of black americans work being disappeared because especially if it's work being done under the conditions of slavery it is in the best interest of whomever is oppressing those people to have the labor kind of disappear into the background because that kind of labor that kind of trauma if it were foregrounded would kind of disrupt the easy you know the easy consumption of, of goods and services produced by slave labor. And so I've just been really interested in how you trace, you know, these historical disappearances of labor or like compressions of trauma and how you trace it up to the present. And I think that's one thing a monument does is it's supposed to draw us a lineage between like something in our past to the present. And there's some people have a, have a, a market, a, like, you know, they've cornered the market on that tracing of history. And I think it's really crucial that people 
are able to propose new ways of tracing these histories up into the present. You know, the criminal justice system, there have been some really interesting dramas recently. There have been really interesting research, you know, projects done recently that just allow us to see how the criminal justice system has been operating smoothly for the last, you know, 200 plus years to put people of color behind bars and even silenced, like just what does it mean to go to court and not be able to rep be represented adequately in court. And I'm just interested in how monuments like remind us of things we need to know. And I think that's the political battle right now. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in in my writing um, and one of the reasons why it's so genius that Sarah was able to put us together is I'm interested in, if you go back to Toward a Monumental Black Body that came out in the spring issue, um, of having a conversation with Black people or marginalized people in general, whatever, however you may, may be marginalized in the United States, about how your body is evidence. You know, building on what Jeffrey said, your body is, is home. It's also the site of your, your memories. It's the site of how you experience the world around you sensually. Um, it's the, it's the, your sense of identity is built from the body out, right? And then when it comes to the marginal, you always have a larger voice, a larger power telling you who you are, what your history is, what the value of your body is, using your body a, a, a long lineage, a history of our bodies as labor, as objects, ungendered, unsexualized, overly sexualized. Um, and so Toward a Monumental Black Body was, was to, trying to do two things at once. It was trying to say like, you are evident, you are the, you know that saying that people get on t-shirts like, I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams, you know, like, um, even in the same vein as that, it's understanding like, What's left of what's happened to all of us collectively as a nation is embodied in you, DNA-wise, trauma-wise, all of these things are in your DNA. And when things like performance happen, to reference like Arian and, and your work, Marisa, it's, it's broken out. It's, it's expressed in some ways. It's found. You know, And that's why I love the interdisciplinariness of both of your practices, because sometimes language just doesn't do it. Sometimes the written word just doesn't do it, especially for people who come from oral history traditions, um, visual traditions. I speak a lot about abstraction in my work because these are the ways in which we share and find each other across cultures, across spaces, across time and history. Um, and then what I'm trying to do in my newer work, which is featured in the newer issue, um, Monumental Futures, is get people to start looking at how artists like the two of you are, are speaking from that space, from the body, from these um, diasporic traditions that have been here, but not necessarily valued the same way as those uh, Greco-Roman um, Egyptian symbols, you know? And to bring Sarah into this, Sarah, um, the title, my title for this talk, Body Memory, is a direct response to your title, Statues Also Die. Um, it was inspired by a Bjork song that I have a love-hate relationship with about the death of a, of a relationship that she had had and how regardless of what she does, that body memory keeps reminding her of what happened to her. Um, and Statues Also Die to me is kind of like the opposite end of that. Also referencing that documentary that talks about how traditional West African artifacts taken into European museums are no longer living because they're no longer able to be performed or, or, or ritualized in the ways that they were. But understanding from the, the object in, how do we make these objects more than stone? How do these objects over time, any, any monument we have, the Statue of Liberty is more than just metal. You know, we, they become more. And I'm, I'm interested in where you, why you chose that title and what that title means to you. Mm. Yeah, um, I think my fantasy is for the state to invest in monuments that have a shelf life, um, that start from a place of sustainability, that can return to the ground and nourish it as it, they disintegrate. Um, one of the things that we see that we're left with after a contested monument is removed from public space is this problem of, well, where do we put it now? and that object has already been invested and endowed with tons of resources, money, surveillance, 
uh, groundskeepers to keep it alive, whatever private sources of funding might have gone in to commission the thing and put it in its place. And as I see such a lack of resources for people just to meet the basic needs of survival going to protect these objects, which kind of in the end are a great history lesson, but also dead weight, um, where do they go? And we don't plan for the future of monuments when we make them um, because the people that are, are usually sponsoring them if they're state sponsored are thinking about how do I maintain power? How do I maintain residence? How do I maintain the narrative that is the sort of national story that uh, I want everyone to remember me by? I want this administration to aspire by. So the end point isn't planned in. Um, and I think statues also die shows us that these statues do have an endpoint and they have an endpoint when they can't stand up to the public. Um, and their publics decide usually as a first action that a new narrative is going to be written on top of these monuments. Um, a second course of action might be to pull them down forcibly. Um, sometimes the state decides to eliminate any any sort of chaos or a sense of public control and will remove them in the middle of the night or early in the morning without warning when no one's looking. Um, but then they still need to go somewhere. So, and, and I think for the people that are in um, working in government or working in museums, those resources don't really exist to maintain these objects. So where do they go is the question. And I, I'm really fascinated by a, you know, a myriad of suggestions that artists have brought to the table. A lot of people want, um, who work in monuments want to have pieces of monuments that are taken down so that they can remake them into other things. Um, some people have buried these statues in cemeteries. Um, and I think the most important part of that is the symbolism of, of removing them from pedestals um, and bringing them down to the place of the earth. Um, and other places, like we see uh, case in point in Budapest, Hungary, for example, um, public parks are dedicated to these monuments that have been contested that represent very violent past. So you can kind of go and visit them all in one um, walk. And it's a harrowing experience actually to go and, and see these things. So I think there is value in keeping them around and keeping them available for the public to acknowledge and to remember. Because um, one of the things that is always the threat is, is how quickly humans assimilate, how quick we are to adapt. This is because we are so used to experiencing and embodying harm that it's our natural instinct to keep pushing forward. Um, but it does allow for a little bit of amnesia to, to be a cloud. And um, so I think, you know, at risk here in this questions of monuments and designing monuments that are designed to die. Um, how do we also design the ones that are important to us to live on in the body? Um, and I, I, I love um, Maurice's uh, piece for that reason, you know, this idea of a monument that's based on storytelling that one walks down a trail and conjures in their own mind produces millions of monuments. Everyone can produce their own and, and its shape and form is different and how they might do this exercise with people that are in a generation above or below them will also shape what monument they realize together. Um, so Statues Also Die is a call to say, we need something different. And, you know, <laughs> artists are, are people who are in the object of studying and using and, and dreaming up new, new means of, of molding materials um, to express our, our, our collective identities um, to mold our future cities. So this is sort of a call to see um, what are some of the strategies that we can do to make, to make new forms of monuments. You brought up so many good, juicy things that could lead this conversation in so many different ways. Um, thank you for sharing that. And I love, uh, there's, okay, so I want to talk about absence, which also Marisa brought up. I also want to talk about iconoclasm, um, which I think is important here. And I want to talk about speculating a future for these objects, a future for our landscapes, right? I want to talk about all of that. Um, oh. Let's, let's, let, let me do my spiel about iconoclasm real quick. So um, 
when when thinking about monumental interventions, I think the the initial thought would be like, well, the, of course, an intervention is iconoclasm, and and many people have many definitions, and it changes culturally what that means um, to piss on something, to to break something's arms, to break something's nose, to all of these different things that have multiple cultural meanings on top of, uh, you know, the statue of King George was his head was cut off and people wanted that head. And you think, oh, it's just, it's just a hunk of marble or a hunk of stone or whatever this is. But these things soak in the meaning and the identity of the communities around them, whether they're working with them or against them. You know, me existing in my black body in St. Louis, when I would walk past the Confederate, the memorial that was in a public park for everybody to see, you know, I'm thinking nobody is offended by this but me. I'm looking around this park. The only person who looks like me is me looking at where it's facing, seeing that it's facing south. You know, like what the symbolism is speaking to me in a way that it is not necessarily speaking to other people. And so when we when we take them down or we get rid of them, that's that that gets rid of the opportunity for iconoclasm. Graffiti is iconoclasm. The way that people are playing basketball outside the Robert E. Lee sculpture is, is iconoclasm. It's transforming them from their initial meaning to, to give it new meaning or to, to humanize. Dorian Garner's piece um, takes a, a, a form of a sculpture, J. Marianne Sims, and makes it flesh. Um, you know, this piece by Nick Cave that's behind you is an, a, an ac accumulation of waste, of, of celebratory waste that becomes something else, terrifying and beautiful and, and purposeful. Um, I'm curious what the artists think, you know, in, in bringing in all three of these kinds of concepts, how do you feel about acts of iconoclasm and how do you respond to absence? Yeah, like iconoclasm um, and thinking about monuments um i i something that that i think about often i'm from the bahamas and uh, and for those of us that are listening discovered Fourteen ninety-two, and so to this day, we still have a Christopher Columbus in the front of Government House, which is the highest uh, state office in the Bahamas. Well, one of the two. Most of the Americas, country hits ninety-two. There's sort of like this boom in in Christopher Columbus iconography, um, and especially. Columbus was sort of seen as like this, like this heralded uh... Hello? Hello? Yeah, so what I was saying is that uh, anytime the century hits 92, around the 90s, there's like this boom in, in interest in Columbus. And he was sort of seen as like this, this he was not British, right? And even though he, he was kind of Italian, but associated with Spain, he was widely sort of adopted as, this is the person who America aspires to be. This is the person, this is the hero that we're gonna model ourselves after, right? Notwithstanding the fact that this dude completely erases anyone that was there before him, right? So this, this act of erasure becomes really important in my sculpture or in my work, right? Because this, it, in some ways it's like mimicking, but it's also sort of teasing um, the similar, the similar uh, strategy that a lot of monuments, and if you think about Robert E. Lee, like that's also a form of erasure, right? Where um, America just celebrated like this huge thing, right? Everyone's supposed to be equal now, but instead what we're gonna do is we're gonna erect these Confederate monuments all over the country to erase that history. Yeah, I, I love the idea of this word iconoclasm. I was looking it up. I was like, wait, what does that mean again? But you've really given me a new, a I, knew that, I knew of the word, but you've given me a nice way to think about a lot of what I 
have been trying to do for a while. As I said, I had been, I had started out with like a an anger around Thomas Jefferson and a and an interest in how his you know mark was felt on the world. Um, not um, it was less about Thomas Jefferson, but more about reading about Jefferson, the way that historians um, psychologize him, the way that they give him in an interior world. They're like, Thomas Jefferson loved, you know, taking long walks and he would have never done this. He would have never done that, but he would have done this. And I was really interested in how another historical figure could be entered into in that way, given an interior world and how by doing that, you perform a kind of graffiti on the image of the other. Um, so, you know, what does it mean to write on Jefferson um, you know, Sally Hemings was here or to kind of shape the spaces that have been carefully um, curated to reflect his being a responsible person and to somehow go to those spaces and perform his irresponsibility. So going to Monticello, a place I'm really obsessed with, you know, historic homes and how they serve as monuments, but to go to places like a historic home, which has been arranged to look like a place of, of respectability and um, purity and a kind of, um, you know, clarity of thought and, you know, integrity of vision and to do something to like rip a hole in that space and then to try to sew that hole up through performance and try to kind of suture two disparate ideas together. That has been really interesting to me because I think while we have monuments on one hand as statues, we also have all of these monuments that are not statuary, like houses, um, as I said, names of streets, like the name, just naming things, um, uh, collections, archives that we keep that are monumental. Um, the Mattituck Museum has a collection of, of presidential signatures. And I've been interested recently in like what it means to collect signatures of these dudes. Um, and so I've been really interested in how the iconoclasm can be performed to highlight the many ways we have um, allowed monument to, to seep into our lives in kind of not, you know, non granite ways. Um, and and because I think that's where people need to be made conscious is that even the stories we tell are monuments, there's some theories about um, nuclear semiotics, like what we're going to tell each other about what people are going to talk about in the future to warn each other about um, nuclear waste and, and, you know, dangers that are no longer visible, especially environmental dangers. And, and a lot of what's come out of that discussion is how we, any of us have produced myths that are no longer, people no longer understand why the myth exists, except that the myth is meant to warn us against some sort of danger that's buried below our feet or, or in the woods or in the depths of the ocean. And so I've been interested in how myth um, can kind of supplant physical monument and how it's already been doing that and how, again, people can work against it in iconoclastic ways. You hit up against so much of what I do and I really appreciate you for that because one of the beautiful things that um, happens in that conversation in the issue uh, with Che Gossett is they say, tear down all monuments to slavery, including prisons and jails. That's a poor quote, but like in monuments, physical monuments, be they to like Columbus or, or your grandparents, like they're all in results of extensions of these institutions that shape our government, our society. And it's like any form of defiance against those institutions is, is resistance, is iconoclasm. You know, they, you go to a public school and you don't walk through the metal detectors. You're saying, you know, I, I don't care to participate. I don't care to revere. I don't care to uphold in these ways that may seem small and insignificant, but symbolically chip away at these, at these materials, these institutions, these, these things, you know, even giving something that is named after a Confederate soldier, a nickname, um, giving it a, a, a that may be that may have multiple meanings. You know, people aren't as blind to this process as, as some people like to think that they are. We are constantly battling over symbols in our in our culture. And whether they be like 
sports mascots or, or prisons or schools or wherever these institutions extend themselves, people are constantly making acts of iconoclasm. And I think consciously or subconsciously, we are all resisting the things that oppress us, I hope. Um, and I, I would love to empower people to continue to resist these things that oppress you. Uh, so yes, thank you so much. And, and what about absence? You know, like I think about histories that, uh, and I've been writing about this a lot recently because I'm preparing for a show, but like, what do we do when there isn't material? You know, the, the idea is that these sculptures last forever. You know, they're kind, of, they're kind of meant to look like they last forever, even though we're a baby nation and most of these just look like they last forever because they're modeled after European forms or, or Egyptian, African, East African forms, but they don't actually, they're not actually that old and they actually take a lot of money and effort and energy to upkeep, right? And so it's like, what do we do with all of those histories that don't have material? How do we start to build those institutions that never kept records? You know, like never where we can't dig up the baskets, they disintegrated. Um, and how does that tie back into the body? If, I'll leave that for y'all. And if anybody wanna pick up, wants to pick up on that. I'm just really into, I mean, I'll just say quickly, like Sadia Hartman, her practice of critical fabulation, I'm pretty deeply invested in what it means to produce parafictional or, um, you know, kind of stories where facts are missing. And honestly, I think I'm a historian's worst nightmare because I'm really interested in how, um, especially with social media or a kind of, you know, circulation of, of alternative facts, you know, those of us who are, are invested in turning things in on themselves or day turn them on can, can plant things within a virtual world, especially, or in a written world, especially that can be mistaken for fact or be mistaken as being a fake artifact. And Sadia Hartman, I mean, her work generally just takes like a small assortment of, of um, you know, primary, primary evidence, but then we'll build a kind of historical fiction around it. And I think that's one way that a lot of artists um, have dealt with and, and scholars who, who see themselves as kind of outside of a strict discipline find ways to deal with absence. Um, but I think that's a huge question. I think the question of what you do when there isn't something there is interesting. And you had mentioned earlier abstraction, which I think is a really interesting word. It could be a whole talk on abstraction, but what does abstraction mean in a world um, where bodies like Emmett Till's can be abstracted in a non aesthetics, you know, a non pictorial sense, historically, like deformed. And then we live in a world, <laughs> sorry, getting, fighting this whole thing off. But when there's that Whitney, Whitney ex exhibition and that painting of Emmett Till was in there, a lot of really interesting questions came up about um, how does abstract art give us any language to talk about legacies of abstraction when you think of the word as just drawing human humanity, soul, life out of bodies? Um, what does it mean to just pull out of people um, what makes them recognizable? And so, yeah, it's not a clear answer to your question, but I think these questions of when you don't have something there to work with, what other language, especially language that maybe comes out of visual theory can be used to help understand how to produce material out of the air. Because I think the conceptual art project has always been one of trying to make something out of nothing or even the blues is about making something out of nothing. Um, I think people, there's a way, people know how to do it. All right, I'm gonna attempt at responding to this, but I'm not sure like if it'll land or not, I'll just give some thoughts. So I grew up, I grew up in a tradition called Jankanu and it is very, it is specific to the Bahamas, but it has roots in West African pre-Columbus traditions, right? And people still celebrate this festival in the Bahamas today. And so a lot, the way that I approach art is from this lens of Chonkanu, right? Chonk to new, right? You use what you have around you to make something. And uh, that really was the first art school that I ever went to. 
but that that knowledge is embodied right um just about everyone in the bahamas understands what it means even though there's not a clear-cut answer to what that is right and i think that leads me to this idea of us rethinking knowledge in some ways because we always sort of favor cerebral like there's cerebral versus intuition slash instinct and i feel like projects or things like John Canoe, right? The things like the the sort of, God, how do I say this? All right, so I was listening to a podcast with Nikki Giovanni and she was talking about how um, all of these enslaved Africans came from like all over, mostly like the West, West Africa and they're all together, but none of them speak languages, right? The same language, everyone sort of speaks different languages, but you know, it only took like one enslaved person to start humming, mm -hmm, and everyone sort of understood what that meant. So in some ways it's about like trusting that thing that's inside of you, trusting that, that, mm, that, that him, <laughs> sorry, I'm like <laughs> drifting a little bit, but it's, it's about, rethinking what we think of as being knowledge or information or intellectual because these things they 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 have weight to me i would agree i would agree that's all i will say yeah <laughs> i would agree too no i i really agree um and i'm glad that you landed on the word trust um, and I, I feel that resonating so powerfully, Marisa, from your project about trusting in many collaborators to come up with the idea that, that led your project to this, for the show. And, you know, in the art papers, TK, that first um, essay that you mentioned by Che Gossett on, on um, the archive of toppled monuments that, that they're collecting is so much about making a space for many people to add their histories, their experiences, the way that they're rewriting knowledge around these monuments that are being taken away. And that to me is, is a porous structure um, that allows different perspectives in. Um, and, and, and in another way, it does this thing that I'm, I'm so curious about. It's like, how, what are the terms by which we come across absence and we understand it as something? you know, like, and that doesn't have an answer because it, 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 it relates profoundly to something that came before it that we do not see. And it makes me think so much of the fury that I feel around anyone who approaches a, a space and, and, and develops on it thinking that is a tabula rasa, which <laughs> this is not. Um, and so how do we, how do we, how do we mark absence? How do we know we're encountering absence when we do it? Um, can it happen in the physical space itself? Does it require an object to have a presence there of a certain amount of time? Does the scar that's left behind or its shadow or its phantom resonate? Who, who carries that knowledge and how do we share it and how do we pass it on? Yeah, that's a tough question. Uh, oh, please. No, I just, I think it's one of the questions um, I think about a lot. Uh, I think for, for myself, it's about how do we make those absences visible? How do we outline them for people who are really struggling to see them? Because I do think there are a range of ways in which people see and don't see. And, and one thing that's visible to one person is not visible to another. And so I think it's that kind of, again, a chorus of people coming together to talk about what they're all seeing and what they're not seeing, and then kind of having that discourse around what's visible and what's not helps to um, helps to agree and come to some like understanding of what's actually there. So I would say just being in discourse about what you see and don't see and being willing to listen and know that you might not be seeing something, but just because you don't see it doesn't mean it's not there, would just be something I would put out there to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's a cheesy Romy coat, and I'm probably gonna butcher it, but Romy says, um, the wound is where the light enters you, right? 
And that's where we're going to be healed, right? You can't just like slap a bandage on the wound. You got to let, you got to really address that wound before, um, before you can move on. And also in tandem, I'm reading this book, The Body Keeps the Score, right? And it really thinks about how, how we move from a space of trauma, right? How that trauma becomes a genetic part of our human DNA, our makeup, the way that we sort of respond to stimuli is sometimes often grounded in trauma, but like, how do we move beyond that trauma and heal? So that's, that's just like as an adjacent side note, something that I'm also interested in in my practice is like moving from that space of trauma into healing and what would that look like? Just to interject real quick, y'all, it's after two o'clock. So do we wanna say we have until 2.30, right? Um, yeah, we have until 2.30. So at 2.15, we'll open up the room for questions. Um, if anybody who is watching now has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat um, or the Q&A feature. I'm not, I'm not sure which one, but send your questions and they'll be fielded to us and we'll try to respond to you promptly. Um, and also the conversation we're, we're talking about is called Monumental Collapse. And that's a conversation between Jillian McManaman, McManaman who um, has an archive in, on Instagram of toppled monuments. And the conversation is really about the performativity of toppling. What does it mean to topple something like this, something that act of iconoclasm with Shea Gossett, both writers, um, both wonderful thinkers. Um, if you have the opportunity, please check out that Instagram. Um, beautiful, it's a beautiful conversation. Hopefully we share that in the chat. Um, I, I love what you said about knowledge and knowledge as a body itself um, is made organically and lost organically. I, I've been trying to be in a mental space of understanding knowledge as something that changes every time I touch something, um, that I understand in new ways when it's not spoken or it's sung or when it's not seen but it's heard and understanding there's all these different ways of understanding something. And that's what makes this conversation so difficult because we are a huge nation. The United States is huge. The Americas are huge. And we're contending with a legacy of slavery. We're contending with a legacy of colonization. How do we tell everybody's history? Which is what I feel like when we're talking about erasure and absence, we're thinking about how do we fill in the gaps, the seemingly endless gaps? Because they are, they're endless. And I think, you know, with Black people specifically being less than 13% of this country, what is our share, if you want to put it that way? How much of the public landscape are you going to give us? Because one of the, th the issues I bring up in my article, Monumental Futures, is why do they keep putting up statues of Harriet Tubman every time something bad happens? Like, why do you keep using our bodies to try to put a Band-Aid over a, a festering wound? You know, like these gestures of monumentality don't necessarily heal or address the issue. And I'd like to add in that it's, it's all systematic. You know, you can't put up a beautiful statue of Harriet Tubman where there's an underfunded school and high percentages of, of black men and women in prison. You can't, what, what is that statue gonna do for me? They have to work for me in tandem. Everything has to work in tandem as our society shifts and changes. And sometimes, and this is what I, I bring up in the article too, the artists out here, and this is, yes, me saying you should pay artists and give them more opportunities to change our landscape. But the artists that are out there doing this kind of work are creating works that don't even exist in the landscapes around them yet. You know, Sarah and I were talking about um, Hank Willis Thomas's All Power to All People. We were talking about Simone Lee. We're talking about um, Wengechi Mutu's Karyatids. We're talking about the two of your work um, and how they sometimes, they just don't feel like the world around them. And that opens up the door to speculation, which is, uh, I feel like a good kind of space to end before we get to the Q&A, like we are trying to collectively speculate what could be, what does justice look like? What does it feel like? What does it sound like? What does it taste like? All of these different ways we're trying to think about addressing the wound and not just covering it up with a pretty band-aid. Um, if anybody wants to take that from me. Um, I love the speculative. Um, I, again, you know, maybe like Jeffrey, my, my thoughts aren't like super 
together yet, but things that struck me recently that I've been thinking about for some time were um, Amanda Gorman's speech at the the um, inauguration. And I have for a while been thinking about this idea of how we look to our ancestors and how we will look as ancestors to the future. And just thinking a little bit about um, how we how we create things that, you know, like the pyramids, you know, things that will be confusing, but interesting and compelling when looked back on in and out of the context, whatever context lives and gets carried along with the objects and, and, and land masses that we make. And I guess when I think about the speculative, I think a lot about kind of what, what will the past look like when we are it and what can we imagine today that will offer really exciting um, like transportational portals in and out of this world. Um, I think Hank Willis Thomas does a really great job of creating objects in space that you know you can imagine being very startling later. Um, and I think we should just start thinking that way about monuments, things just asking ourselves why monuments have to keep looking the way they look and what is actually transportational about a monument. And maybe it's augmented reality, maybe it's gonna be a screen, maybe it's just gonna be like a hole in the earth. Um, maybe it's gonna be, it should be a little confusing because I think when it comes to this question of reading the monument, it should be so dense that it can potentially be read multiple ways Think a lot about like the Bible, like it's confusing, and that's maybe why it lasts so long. Is people keep wanting to make sense of it, and you know maybe we should start thinking about our monuments being a little less clear and a little bit more transportational, for better or worse. Um, and that's how I, I yeah yeah speculative. I so I have. I have this practice that I started rooting within my practice and it is called the Institute of Self-Care. And I realized right around the start of the pandemic last year that I was not okay, sort of emotionally and psycho, not like that I was like losing my mind or anything like that, but I think there's something something to be said that you can open up your cell phone and any other given day there's a black person being brutalized by the police, right? Or you can turn on the TV and it's it's not hard to find, right? So for me, collective speculation and thinking about the future and thinking about monuments, right? Like to me the most transgressive thing that I can do while I'm alive breathing in this body is to take care of myself, right? I think that's a radical act of kindness and care and compassion and, right? And just imagine if, if we had 13% of the population operating from that space, right? Where we don't think of ourselves as being in lack or in need or underneath or being at the mercy of a another population where we really reframe the narrative. And another thing that I think about as well is um, I went to Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture with this brilliant artist, um, Ariel Jackson. And she said something that kind of blew my mind uh, one day. She said that she's trying to live her best life today now to prepare her to be a better ancestor when she passes. And that's it. Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to throw in? I did. And then what Jeffrey just said just zapped my brain of what I was <laughs> about to contribute. I'm so sorry. Carry no, on. No. <laughs> um, I think that the future is in the present, like we are presently making the future right now in this conversation, but then in all those choices we make day in and day out, whether it be to like get up and speak or whether it be to rest and restore. Um, one of the, the issues I have with future making, 
and you can push back on me because I was just talking about speculative futures and now now I'm all over the place because it's not an easy conversation, right? It's like, how do we respond to what people need? Like actually, actually need right now, not, you know, like in 1865 when the Daughters of the Confederacy were building these monuments, not in 1960 when they were still building these monuments. Um, but now, like what do people in my neighborhood need? In COVID, what do we need? Um, and what will we need tomorrow? Because we're looking at a tomorrow where some of us aren't going to be there. You know, people are already talking about what does a monument look like to COVID-19? What, what will it look like for us? And then we, Sarah and I talked about the 9-11 uh, memorial in New York and how that absence feels so true and, and translatable across, across disasters but how it can be read differently if you wear hijab, how it can be read differently if you are an immigrant, how it can be read differently if you are a black person or had a family member who worked in those buildings, how it can, how it can be dense, like Marisa says, it's dense and, and, ha and holds many, many histories. And so I think it's, it's a hard conversation. And if I could leave anybody with anything that's out there listening to these conversations, having these conversations is always pull it back to what is needed now. You know, there are a lot of histories out there. There's so much, but the, think of the histories you needed when you were young or the histories that your community needed before it was displaced or disbanded. Think about histories or, or future speculating that can be taken with you when you are displaced, that can be taken with you when people try to erase you. And always, I think, pull it back to the body and fortifying yourself. Like Jeffrey said, fortify yourself in that because at the end of the day, we're we're the evidence of what we have right now, you know, and I may not have a tongue tomorrow, but I still have eyes and I have hands and I may not have hands tomorrow, but I still have something to give people later. So um, that's how I'll end it. Thank you everybody so much. And can we take some questions? Uh, how, how are we doing this? Yeah, um, there's a really great question right now in the Q&A box from uh, Amira Brown. Amira writes, Hi, I was really interested in addressing the genetic and generational wounds and how they become the site of potentiality. I've been thinking of also the co-opting of black life after death in memification, as well as the refusal of death through use of imagery as TK noted. Christina Sharp from In the Wake notes of a work of addressing these issues of absence and caring for the absence. What does this look like for all of you? How do we care for those obscured by the institutional elevation of the corrupt? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Christina Sharp. I have the book up here. I wanted to stop like picking up books and showing them, but I'm, I'm working on a project right now in Charlottesville. It's to create an augmented reality journey through Charlottesville where these ghosts um, are conjured and um, the larger aim of it is to, to help find a resting place for Sally Hemings who um, we don't know where she's buried. And so I've been really interested in these questions of what you do when you don't know where someone's site is. And, and that for me feels like part of this in the, this wake work of trying to figure out how to keep foregrounding the not knowing and have the not knowing be the monument and to also give people something they can hold in their phones and that they can do and play and navigate um, safely, like distance wise. I mean, I, I think that's something people need right now is, is ways to stay busy um, without, <laughs> without being exposed to COVID. Um, and also about, you know, something I know that I wanted when I was young and I'm, I have a, you know, I, I had a very privileged upbringing, but I remember, you know, going to sites and not seeing people like me represented in the past. And so it's been really important to me to just let people know that black people existed in the past and to make kind of artworks that visualize the past and re, re put black people back there. Because I think that's part of the wake work is to like put people back into the historical narrative where they've been erased um, so that we also know to keep putting them in the future narrative where they're almost at the moment also being erased. Um, so yeah, I think that wake work is also a lot about just kind of making 
retelling absences, like just reinscribing, keep talking about the absence and explaining why it happened. Um, but that's a really great question. People should be re reading in the wake. We could have a reading group. Yeah, I, I really, I really love that question. I mean, I don't know if I have like a solid answer to that, um, but I can say that there's something like going back to like this whole idea of ancestry to something that feels so empowering, knowing that, you know, it's almost as if we're functioning on like this vantage point, right? And and being able to like access those that came before us and honor them, I think is is significant, right? And hold space for them. And yeah, and, and just being able to see that that there's space in 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 the multiple dialogues right for all of this space to contain all of this information um and i may not be the the like the, the most readily equipped person to speak about this but it's certainly been really great to see artists like titus kafa and others who and yourself marissa who really hold space around these narratives right but yeah I also personally like thinking that I am collaborating with some people who aren't here. Like I really love Octavia Butler and I just really like to think she's with me and that some of the work I do is about just making sure she gets sainted or knighted or, you know, like canonized. I think something you learn when you're in art school is like these canons get produced just by someone talking about someone over and over again in crit. And I've been really interested in how different types of people can be brought into the critique and really be used to explain artworks, especially by black and brown artists where historically in institutions, there have been no contexts. You know, if no one reads Christina Sharp, no one then knows how to critique your artwork and then it just gets reproduced. So I've been really interested in institutions, especially schools, how we can change the conversation around artists of color's work so that they're getting a fair, you know, a fair critique that pulls on, that's this question of different types of knowledge, like all the different situated knowledges that get excluded from institutions. Um, situated knowledge is a great concept people should look up also, which is, this idea that we get knowledge from um, from lots of different places and from inside our bodies, mm. and it's worth it's worth honoring those even inside academia. Yeah, I, I love that. Um, this is going to be a little bit tangential, but um, going back to the body keeps the score, Basil van der Kolk he wrote it, and uh, one of the things one of the driving principles in that book is whenever he had students, he always tells his students, um, and this is about medicine in the body, right? But he also, he always tells his student their first semester, he doesn't allow them to rely on text at all. He's like, the information is in the front of you, right? You're dealing with people that are suffering from PTSD and different mental and psychological um, uh, impediments, that the information is in the front of you. Nothing you can ever read from a textbook will ever surpass what you're looking at right in the front of you. Yeah, I would just like to add, you know, coming from a white perspective, like what, <laughs> what, what, what can, what is a site of potentiality in the generational wounds that white people hold on to? And, and I think the greatest site is reflecting on our ancestry and reflecting on how and when our ancestors decided to assimilate into whiteness. I mean, it is a social construct. And I think in the arts, in a lot of cultural circles, a lot of attention, a lot of dialogue is um, thinking about blackness and the black experience and the black body. And the charge to white people is to not appropriate that space, um, to, is to look back on the self and understand how white identity um, 
has been constructed, created, perpetuated, and continues to be embodied. So that's my, that's my site of hope for myself and for other white people. Um, and I'll piggyback off of everybody and say, interdisciplinary scholarship is great. Like it's, it's not just the future of art history, it's the future of every discipline. You can't really tell a full story without all of these different methodologies, all of these different canons and different thinkers pushing against those canons. And also even outside of the institution of like higher education, like your ancestors, I feel like give them some credit. You know, Toni Morrison said in, in that interview, like it's all in my books. Like we have unconventional ways of, of passing knowledge, but they are past and they are in us and they are around us all the time. And I think artists and, and, and non-conventional historians, non-conventional cultural workers are doing that digging work to really interpret these things for the people who have who've forgotten or don't value what a, how a quilt speaks or how a blues song speaks or how these different cultural productions still speak. Um, in Oh, you just froze for one minute. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, you were talking about how a palette quilt speaks. Oh yeah, it's just it's um, just remembering that sometimes you are given what you need. You just have to value it. Um, and sometimes that absence is intentional. Some people don't want you to know, um, or they hope that you're better off not knowing, <laughs> which is usually the case with trauma, but. It keeps on coming anyway. Uh, do we have another question? Yeah, um, we do. We have one more question. Um, this one comes from Sarah Higgins, who's co-editor on Art Papers. Um, she says, my question returns to TK's comment about the necessity of monuments, representation of suppressed histories, historically oppressed peoples reflecting on real systemic changes rather than being a cover up. When thinking about valuing and empowering impermanence, privileging it over false notions and assertions of permanence, would any of you like to speculate about what the value of impermanence would look like systematically? That's a big question. I have so much to say about that, so I'll go last. I'm just, I'll just throw out ideas, things that have been interesting to me as an op you know, as, as alternatives to, to permanence are like sustainability. Is sustainability something, it's not about something being permanent, but about it being um, regenerative or reproductive or um, rhizomatic, networked. Um, you know, I'm thinking back to Jeffrey singing the song and, you know, the ability of people to sing a song together as a type of, you know, sustainable, practice that's not necessarily permanent, but known and reproducible. Um, and so I think systematically, I think if we could, you know, make our systems of care smaller or more local or tighter and, um, you know, be able to shift some of our political thinking toward the, the, communi the co communal, those could be spaces where some of these systematic ideas of permanence could be transformed into systems of sustainability or, you know, like, like communal living or, you know, just practices of, of mutual support. So I would say when it comes to the system, that's not an art answer, but just like making things smaller and more local. I feel like for me, this question mostly has to do with, or at least I feel like the way that I'm digesting this is having to do with the physicality of things, right? Um, the way that we think about uh, West African and a lot of African communities as being um, oral, like grounded in oral things that pass on um, from generation to generation, right? But I think about that as being permanent in some ways, right? 
the only reason why there's this gap that sort of happens where we start to think about neurosis being like disappearing or impermanent is because this really violent thing happened where we stripped a people of their like of who they are right but there's still a lot of things that survived when you look at traditions like susu and a lot of the foods in the caribbean and south south um uh south of uh continental us right a lot of those traditions still survive and i still think about those things as being permanent and maybe again it goes back to repositioning the way that we think about information and about knowledge like going back to the sort of intuitive and instinctual and somehow that can become permanent but i'm also interested in how that interfaces with like this boom in technology that we're experiencing right now and what what would that mean how does that shift the way that we think about the way that cultures and information and traditions are stored and passed on yeah just to add to that i agree i think it goes back to the space of knowledge and who is in the driver's seat when it comes to interpreting our, our collective pasts i dream of museums that rotate in different interpreters and and really enunciate the fact that you know we're creating narratives around these objects and they're coming from a particular cultural geographical political religious go on and on perspective um how do we let more people come in as interpreters of those objects how do we let people come in to decide what objects museums preserve um, you know, that is the, the role of our art institutions. And there are a, a core of group people that are usually at the decision making table supported by academics. Um, and in all these repatriation cases, we see they're so slow to get moved through taking anywhere from 10 to 20 years to actually bring um, an, a cultural object of sacred significance back to their original um, tribe or owner or community. Um, so, you know, that process is slow, it's mucky. And, and how do we just, how do we let more people in as being steering the knowledge that um, we're understanding as, as um, the narratives that define our collective past? And I, I really do, I have a lot to say about this. And I feel like it was a trap because Sarah knows me so well. Um, but really just piggybacking off of everything everyone has said, I love the idea of how uncomfortable this, this discourse makes me because it's constant. Like I can't pull up my phone and not see something about something that I've been working on for years. And it's like, I'm not the only person in the room anymore. And the conversation is growing and growing and growing and things are being done. Artists are responding, musicians are responding, historians are responding, and we're chipping away at that myth of object objectivity, you know, that uh, that myth of I can take myself out of this. I'm I'm a hundred percent for let me tell you how this makes me feel as a black man living in America right now. Like I I love the conversations that are happening and what we're able to pull out of each other in having these very vulnerable conversations in artists creating work where they use their own bodies to talk about the relationships we have to history and to a speculative future like all of that is is the value and it's the meat of this uh, it's about that constant dialogue that constant conversation and i think the landscape sorry um i think the landscape should reflect that it should it should change and pedestals should should you should be able to swap out swap one in or put them in different contexts or one of the most beautiful things that I find about Kehinde Wiley's or or uh, Kara Walker's Fons Americanus or Wengechi Mutu's Karyatids at the Met are that they move and they're built and intended to move across the, across a city across a country in different museums in different contexts what happens if our our monuments start to move and be placed in different contexts and be gifted to different people so that people can respond to it and say this is our history this isn't our history this is racist let me tell you why that's racist this is problematic that's sexist because these are the conversations we need to have to change each other you know and be less racist and less sexist and less classist and all of these other things so i'm i'm in for the discourse i'm in for our landscape looking like discourse
and I'll end it there for today. <laughs> um, I think that's a great note to end on and just a beautiful image to land on the sense of mobility and, and rewriting objects as they travel from place to place, decentralizing this idea of hyperlocality, of boundaries, of borders, of being more migratory. <laughs> as you know, the human species migrates, we move. Um, so thank you so much, TK, for joining us, for leading us through this conversation. Marisa, Jeffrey, my goodness, I'm sorry that you, I mean, there were so many pauses that I was transported um, so deeply into the, your thoughts and how you invest those in the works that you make. Thank you for, for working and sharing um, your labors with us. We are all the better for it. Um, I wanna just re-remind everyone that they should buy a copy of the fall winter 2020 issue of Art Papers. Um, I say this because it's so good. It's so good. It's so legible. It's so readable. It's so pleasurable to move through. Um, and you can get it online and you can buy a copy for $10 or you can become an annual subscriber for $35. Uh, it's really worth the investment. Um, so we're at 2.35, uh, I'll let everyone go and wish everyone a, a warm, safe, pleasurable last few hours of Sunday. Take Thank care. you, Sarah. Thank you, TK. Thanks, Jeffrey. Thank you Thanks, all. Thanks everybody, it was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, it was fun. Bye.